Welcome, welcome. This is Joe. Uh, and I, I do like to kick this off and say, yeah, this is live. Uh, we are live. It is what is March 14th today. Uh, it's 10 a.m. here. I'm in Victoria, British Columbia, having a good time. And thanks for everybody that's joining here. I see a couple of people just getting started. Um, and what we're doing, we're talking about sales today. We're just going to, you're going to see my face for like about a minute and a half here. And then I'm going to jump on and show you some slides. And really, um, this has come about. I've started to do a few webinars the last little while just to share some ideas, share some content, stuff that I go through with my clients. Um, some ideas to try and help you get some clarity on uh, on your business and just yeah if you can in the in the chat there you know tell me where you're from and uh, where what's going on what's going on in your world I got a couple of people answering surveys before they come in about some of the challenges we're gonna go through that as well um, switch things up a bit today from what I did last week but really just um, yeah just have some fun and try and sit. I like to try and work on simplifying having more fun with the sales process. I think people overcomplicate it. And I think that sometimes we just get a bit overwhelmed with all the stuff that we could do and all the steps and all the advice. And so my goal here today is just help you just simplify and uh, just make this a lot easier. Uh, I do like to, I'll start with a bit of a story is we, uh, last year, uh, kind of a cool thing happened. Uh, my girlfriend and I, we had our car stolen. And uh, and why was it cool? Well, guess what? We get to buy a new car. <laughs> and so we went around, uh, went looking at uh, these different dealerships, looking for a car. And it's really fun to go and buy stuff, right? Like it's really fun to go out and get something new. And And then who wrecked it for us? Yeah, salespeople. Salespeople ruined it and they they would come out and they would just say all the stuff that we didn't want to hear. We were so excited to go for that experience, have that journey and go and make a purchase. But then people come out and start telling us stuff that they want to say, not what we want to do until we finally found somebody that actually knew what to talk to us about, which was about the excitement and what do we want to use it for? Who's the car for? What are we going to be doing? Asking all sorts of really awesome questions. And that's really a big uh, fundamental piece in selling. And so what I want to throw at you first before we jump onto the sides is that if you want to get good at selling, if you want to get good at, well, you know, helping more people buy from you, go become a part of other people's sort of sales process. Go and see how it feels for you as a consumer, as a buyer, to see what that feels like uh, emotionally. We're going to talk about some of the science today. We're going to look at some of the neuroscience, some of the psychology. I'm going to talk to you about how you can create repeatable best practices and how you can really just make this stuff so much easier. And this is these are the things I use with my clients um, all over the world with our different programs. And I just thought I'd share the love with some, some of the content that we've been sharing. So I'm going to flip over um, and uh, jump on the, uh, the slideshow so you don't have to see my face anymore. I've got a bunch of cool slides. So we're going to have some fun. So here we go. There we are. And let's share that. So yeah, so today this is this is what we're talking about, mastering the sales conversation. And like I said, this is what I use with clients um, that I work with all over the world. And so it's also, no matter what your business is, um, I will share with you, th these are the exact same processes that I use um, to charge, you know, $500 to $2,000 an hour for the services that I put through for my clients. We do training and workshops all over the place from, you know, small startups to large corporate multinational companies. And these are the things that people are, are getting results from. And so that's what we're going to be going through. And I think the funny thing is, is like I said about the, the car salesman idea is I think that's what a lot of people think selling is, is they think it's about going out and, you know, being this salesy person. So one of the things we want to talk about today is how to be less salesy, how to not come across like, you know, somebody we're not. And, and how, how many times do you find yourself you know, getting caught in that salesy role because you don't really know what else to do. So you go out, whether you've got an amazing product or service, you're going out and you're, you're being this salesperson and you know what that feels like when you start to feel salesy. And here's the funny thing is um, I do a lot of one of the, the the cool things I get to do is I get to listen to sales calls from all sorts of industries all over the place. It's kind of one of my nerdy things I like to do is just I listen to them in my car and I like to break them down. I don't listen so much for the, the words that we say or what we say so much as I listen for that subtle interplay, that connection between two humans talking and where we miss opportunities and typically conversations pivot on one of two things. They either, they either pivot on a, an opportunity that we missed, an area that we didn't ask a question, right? Or it pivots on something we said, whether it was good or bad, but maybe we said it at the wrong time. So missing an opportunity to connect and saying something at the wrong time. Those are the two things that typically we're going to miss out on when we're talking. But here's the real funny part for me is there's this phenomenon that I've noticed as I've been watching people in their sales call, people in the wild. And what I notice is that... Um, is when we do our sales training, 
is they're super awesome. We're having a good time. We're, we're talking about things and we're role playing and they're saying things that, and they're, they're getting excited. They're being super connected and genuine. And then I listen to people get on the phone or I see them, you know, doing a sales call or, or meeting with somebody or networking. And all of a sudden they start to be somebody they're not right. I, and hopefully, you know, you know what I'm talking about when this happens to you. And so I, last year I was trying to put my finger on what that is called. And so I just came up with my own term. And the first thing I'm going to tell you is don't be a salesy weirdo. Now I just love this picture from the dog. Um, but really being a salesy weirdo. Now, if you're already weird, that's okay. Be weird, be whatever you want to be. But when you become a salesy weirdo, what that means to me is that it's the distance between how you normally would interact with your uh, friends, your family, what would it would be like if you go out to the pub with a buddy and the this other person that you become. And I've, I've kind of noticed there's two types of weirdos. The first one is that, that one that's really overly formal where we have an agenda. We've maybe got a script. We've got, you know, a list of questions we're trying to get through. And we talk like, hi, I just want to talk to you about these things today. Oh, that's really interesting. Now, can you answer me this? Okay, well, that's that's really interesting or yep, that makes sense. And here's the next thing. We just go through this list and we're totally disconnected from that other person because we're trying to sound smart. We want to make sure we sound professional. The other weirdo is that overly enthusiastic one. And you know the one I'm talking about where you pick up the phone and they go, hi, how are you today? And you can smell right away that you're being sold to. So that's the first thing we're going to focus on is like, let's not be a salesy weirdo. When you catch yourself doing it, just try and stop. But what I end up seeing is that we catch ourselves being a bit of a weirdo. So what do we do? We just keep going and we keep being more and more weird. So we're going to talk about how to get past that. The, on the flip side is being a sales hero. This is what I talk about. I've got uh, sales hero academy, sales hero podcast. I really like talking about this stuff. But what it means is that we're not going in to swoop in and save the day. We're not trying to rescue our customers. What we're trying to do is help them become heroes. We're trying to lift them up and, and make them better for having worked with us. And your job as a hero is not to solve problems, but to help your customers become heroes themselves. And so really it's about all this hard work. It's about the fact that you're sitting on this, this workshop right now for the next little bit talking about this stuff so that you can get better at helping your customers get better. Now, first thing I like to go into is, is the idea of money. Now, money is a crazy thing. And, and, and I always ask people about, you know, do we give it way too much power? And, and absolutely. Money has this really interesting psychological effect, which we're going to talk about. And the, the, the trick is, is that money, if you think about back to in the beginning of time, money didn't exist. What happened was, is if I had a canoe and you had some furs, we would just exchange. And if we felt like that was a fair deal, we would exchange those canoes and furs. <clears throat> and so... That's what we did. But then somebody said, well, what if we don't want this, what somebody else has? So we created this currency. We created money. And since then, we've been warring and fighting, and, and it's given just so much power. But I want you to think about this for a second. Money just represents that indirect exchange of value. And value is subjective to the other person on the other end. So what you may think of as value may be different for somebody else. That's why I always say don't make decisions from other people's wallets. So when I do workshops, I have a workshop coming up next month where people pay 20 grand for the day for me to come in. Now, I wouldn't pay 20 grand to see me talk, but I have clients who do because I'm helping them improve their position and that's the value that we've created. So think about that as you're looking at your offer and you're thinking about selling is what is it that you're doing that represents value for somebody else? Not how much money should I charge, but what's the value that we're going to create? We're going to get into that more. Now, the other part is we look at a lot of the psychology. And I'm gonna, I get real excited about the psychology and the neuroscience about stuff. And there's a wonderful book called Thinking Fast and Slow by a guy named Neil Kahneman. And what, what he talks about is the way that brain works. And he was talking about some ideas like priming. And priming is essentially anything that happens to you um, This is really subtly that can directly or indirectly affect how you think, behave, and act in the future. And so money priming is what they did with people is they put them in these little groups and they would introduce ideas like money, like cash and and, and profit. And some of them, they, they would show screensavers of, of a cash, like a, some money. And then they had them go at do activities. And so the ones that were primed with money did things a little bit differently than the ones that weren't. So one of the activities they had them do was they put them in this room where like, you know, almost like a classroom where they were filling out these surveys and one of the facilitators would come around and they would accidentally drop some pencils. And what happened was the people that were primed with money would pick up only about half as many pencils as the ones that weren't. Think about that. That's crazy, right? The next thing they had them do was they, they would have other people go into this room and they would go into this empty room and they say, hey, take these two chairs 
and you're gonna go set up this these two chairs to have conversation with somebody uh, and somebody will be right in with you and what happened the people that were primed with money would set those chairs on average about 118 centimeters apart versus the ones that weren't primed with money it was about 80 centimeters apart and so what this tells us, and there's all sorts of studies like this, all about what's going on in our mind when we think about money. When we're thinking about money or what we want from somebody else, especially money, is these two things happen. One, we are less likely to help. And two, we create these really unnecessary subconscious barriers. And what's going on is what I end up calling it is it's sales breath. It's that same breath that the, the like I was explaining, the, the car salesman would do is they're not here really to help me and they're not really trying to connect with me. What they're trying to do is they want money. They're primed with money and that's no fault of theirs. It's just they haven't done the work to not think about money and think about when you're going into a sales call, when you're talking to a customer, when you're building an offer, when you're putting something online, is this about you or is it about them? So the first thing I want you to think about is in every communication you have, what value do you offer? When you do a webinar, when you send out an email, is this for you or is this for them? Is this adding value to their world or is this something you're asking for from them? And when you're having a conversation, is this adding value to them or is it something that you're trying to take? And so when we look at it, let's think about the customer stages for a sec. Now I get to do my little touch screen action here on my computer. When we look at customer stages, here's what we need to think about is we've got all these ways that people come to you, right? Now, if you came to this, you might have come and seen this through Facebook. You may have looked at an ad. We may have been on a list. We may have done all sorts of things where we look at this. Um, you know, there's uh, all sorts of things. So we look at all these ways to advertise. And what we're trying to do is essentially, we want somebody to, in the first stage, become a lead, right? We want somebody basically to say, I want to connect with you. And so when we look at the value exchange, what we're trying to do is we want to figure out what do we want from people and it, what do we give in exchange? And if at every stage in your process, every stage in your sales funnel, your marketing funnel, you have to say, what do I want? So for you to come on this webinar, I want, I just simply want your contact info. And so for me, I'm going to give you the promise of some info and some ideas that you can use right away. And you have to decide, is that a fair exchange for me? Is that a good value exchange? And if you like that, you say, yeah, you know what? I'll give you my info and you tell me what's up. And that's how it is. Now, it's even more important on a webinar. The next one is, is we want to get people to become a prospect. So think about in your business, the next thing you want from people is we want some time, right? You want to be able to sit down, have a meeting. Maybe you're doing a discovery call or initial call, or the first thing you do is say, Hey, let's do a little bit of a strategy session, whatever it is that you're doing. And in order to justify that time, you need to really be believe that you're going to deliver on that value. They need to say, Hey, I'm going to connect with somebody that's going to be able to help me through something. I'm willing to give up some of my time to be able to spend time with you because I feel like there's going to be value on the other end. Now, in order for us to move forward, we want to have qualified prospects right? And we need to get something from them and we need to give something to them. And then we want to be able to give a proposal. We want to be able to create customers and then we want to be able to get referrals. I won't spend a bunch of time on this, but at each phase, this is what we do in our training is we look at every single stage that your customer goes through, what percentage of them are moving forward. Let's run it down here. Percentage of these guys are moving forward. What do we ask for and what do we give them? And all the thing is funny here is that customers are here right? This is where money comes in. So if you look at your business and you look at your process and your sales conversation, all of this stuff happens way before somebody gives us money. So you have all this opportunity to create value, to create excitement, to create energy. And then you get good at understanding each one of these stages and what's working and what's not. And you have to figure out, what this looks like before you get to money. So you can see there's so much more value involved in the sales process. And what we do in the conversation side is we focus on this area here. We focus on how to build the really good conversation. Hope that makes sense for you. Pen off, keep going. So I always ask people, how many of you guys need more stuff to do? Nobody needs more stuff to do. Everybody is busy, man. Everybody is freaking busy. And it's so bad now that I was watching something a while back and uh, and I see now they have these smart water bottles. Water bottles that are geared specifically to tell you when to drink, a, drink water, when to hydrate. Now, if we're so wrapped up in technology like that, and we think about all the things we have to do every single day. Now, nobody ever says, yeah, I need more stuff to do. Everybody's busy. Think about your customers. 
Think about what's going on in their world and how much stuff they have to do so that when you show up and say, hey, I want to talk to you about taking some of that money or, or interrupting what you're doing and trying to change your world with this amazing offer, they're, you're still cutting into their stuff. So in order to do that, we really do need to look at how the value exchange works. So here's the thing. When we look at our business, I look at it in three ways. When I look at sales, I look at it in three sort of three ways, business, sales, everything. The first one is I want you to look at your business and think, what do I have right now that are my tested processes? What are the things that I do predictably, repeatedly that I know these things work, these things don't? How many of those things have I documented? How many of those things am I testing? How many times have I tried this thing, learn from it? And if you don't have tested processes and are thinking systemically, you need to step back and write this stuff down and say, where where am I getting a, 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 the next phase? And so when we look at what we just said, customer stages, even just taking that and mapping that out to your own business and say, okay, I'm going to start testing how well I ask for information, how well I set up appointments, how well I move people through these stages and start to get better and better. Now, the next part is we look at the behavioral psychology. This is where I get really excited about how people make decisions. So I study what's called social cognitive neuroscience, which is all about how people interact with each other and what goes on. And I really originally started studying that just because I wanted to figure out why I do so many crazy things. But understanding, we're going to talk about that today. I'm not saying you need to study this. I'm going to tell you some ways that people make decisions. And most of the time there's mistakes that we're making when we're communicating with them that I'm going to show you how to just stop doing that. And then the last one is a big one. We talk about mindset and your mindset is absolutely everything. We have, um, I just did a call the other day and we've talked a lot about doubt and insecurity and being able to break past those barriers of your own doubt and insecurity so you can better serve others. And so the mindset is the thing that allows you to go in and take care of your customers, even though you're feeling like you want money and you need to pay your bills and whatever it is that you're working on in your business so that you understand how to be much more present, much more engaged, much more genuine and supporting to help your customer move to the next step. Now, one of the things that I like to talk about is habits. There's a wonderful book called The Power of Habit by a guy named Charles Duhigg, and he talks about how habits work, and it's really fascinating to me that they study these areas like the basal ganglia. This is in our brain where this is the, this is the seat of all of our habits, and what happens is we don't ever lose our habits. We just replace them with stronger habits, and what we do is we create new neural pathways, and so what we do is when, when I'm mapping out my sales process, it's the same thing as I'm looking at how to create the right habits in everything we do. Now that means that we don't necessarily go through scripts and we're going to talk about the conversation roadmap itself uh, in, a, in a little bit here is how to actually structure your conversation based on the right habits. Now what they do is here's the study. They, they, they take these mice. And the cool thing about the way psychology works these days is that we can actually study the brain in action, not you know slice it up anymore, but they can actually study. They put the electrodes in, the fMRIs, they study humans and rats, and they say, what's really going on? And this is why habits are so fascinating. So they take this rat, this door opens, you can see there's a click, and it goes down the hallway, and then it turns left, and there's some, there's some chocolate right? Now, initially what happens is the brain is firing on all cylinders when the rat first does this activity because it's looking around, it's trying to figure out what's going on in its environment. You do it a number of times and the rat starts to get familiar with where that chalk is going to be. And, and here's what happens to the brain is all of a sudden it moves from activity the whole time to now activity just during the click less brain activity through the, the going down the hallway and turning left and then activity when we get the chocolate. Okay, so what this is, is when we build our process, I want you to think about these things, the cue, the routine, and the reward. And what these are, cue is also a name for trigger. So what we're looking for is when, when we're having conversations, when we're building our sales process, let's understand what are those cues and what are those rewards? What are, what are we looking for and what are we trying to do? And then how do we build a better routine in the middle? How do we build a better sort of micro conversation when we identify this happens? And this is what we try and do so that we become a lot more a lot more, I would say, relaxed what we're doing. But what we're doing is we're decreasing that mental energy throughout that process. When we decrease that mental energy, guess what? That brings in more uh, available space so we can be even more present, so we can be more connected because we know what we need to do. We can kind of, we can kind of sit down and be in that state of flow, which is really, really important when we're talking. 
Now, if you think about your business as a whole, think about your sales process, let's look at it this way. In your world, have you mapped out what you need to do for the year? If you haven't, maybe it's time to sit down and write some goals. What am I trying to do? What do I want to do each quarter? And what do I want to do each month? What are my plans this month? Do you have a plan for, now we're halfway through March, do you have a plan for the rest of March and for April to say, okay, here are the things that I'm trying to accomplish. And now let's break them down by the day and the task that I need to do. So we set it up as a series of projects rather than a list of to-dos. When we start to have to-do lists, that becomes overwhelming. I want to see that you got tasks and things that are leading you to a result. And what we do then, we look at our processes and say, what are the things we can do repeatedly? Like our contact strategy. Do you have an outreach strategy for new clients, whether they're inbound or outbound? Do you have a series of emails, a series of calls, a series of things that you do that you've been testing? Different kinds of voicemails you leave, different kinds of emails that you send. Maybe you text maybe you use LinkedIn, social media. What is your strategy for connecting with new people? And are you getting better and better at that? Or are you just kind of spraying and praying? And hopefully a bunch of people just show up and sign up for whatever your offer is. The next one, is where we talk about today is the conversation itself. Do you have a series of questions and insights and ways you ask for commitment so you can better predict what that sales conversation is going to look like? And then we look at what are our customer segments? What are the kinds of people that we deal with and how can we categorize them better so we speak more clearly to that audience of one in our messaging, in our sales process, so we know more effectively how to move people forward. And then as we just talked about, what are our customer stages? What are the steps that people go through predictably so that we can move them along a path that makes the most sense? We can ask them for the right um, commitment at the right time. Then we get good at observing our stuff. How well can you actually observe what you're doing? How can you step away from being caught in all of the stuff in your own business and say what's working, what's not? And then are you actually tracking your results, building you know, reports, whether you're doing it in Excel or you have a really complex CRM, are you seeing am I effective as or what? the things that I'm doing actually moving the needle. And this is one thing a lot of people don't spend a lot of time on is looking at their metrics, looking at their KPIs and saying, what's the stuff that works? Because it's easy to get so busy and so, so busy. So then we say, okay, well, let's build some feedback loops. Everything we do is a feedback loop. Let's see what worked, what didn't, what can we learn from it? What makes me happy? What makes my customers happy? How can we do more of that? How can we have more fun with that stuff? Once we know these things, then we set some new goals. We say, okay, now we've got a better system. We got a better setup. Now we set some goals and guess what? We bring it back into our calendar and say, okay, let's, re let's redo this. Let's get better and better. And this is the process that you can use to get consistently better every single time. And what you're trying to do with this is once you've mapped it all out, then you say, okay, when I have this kind of customer and they get to this stage in the process and I ask these questions or I share this insight that either works or it doesn't work. Now, if you're not at that level with the stuff that you're doing, maybe it's time to step back and say, hey, how can I build this so that I can be more effective? How can I structure so I have you know, my key few questions, my key few insights, the kinds of conversations that I have that move people forward. Knowing what I know about the kinds of customers I'm dealing with, I know these are the triggers for them and these are the things I do once I identify those triggers, which allows me to ask for commitment much more effectively. And that's why we build these conversations. If you think about it, the five buying decisions. Now go back to you being a customer. Matt, put yourself in the shoes of the, of the customer right now and ask yourself if these buying decisions happen to you when you're out doing this. And so the first buying decision is, guess what, is they buy from you. They decide whether they know, like, or trust you as a seller. Now, too often we get so wrapped up in all the stuff that we forget this. They they buy based on your ability to ask great questions, to, at, to help them understand what's really going on, getting them to agree that there's a need, helping them see, get clarity on what they're trying to do. And then guess what the second buying decision is? They say, if you get hit by a bus, if you get hit by a car, whatever, wherever you are, can I buy from this company? Do I like this company? Can I associate my brand and my, my connections with this company? Then they decide, what's the product? How much is it? And is this a good time to buy? Now, typically what ends up happening is where do they start? Number three and four, they say, what is it and how much is it? And so we get caught 
in this sort of black hole of answering questions about all the stuff when we should be spending more time showing them our abilities to ask good questions and have the right conversation. So really the first buying decision is you, you're the product. That's why it's so important to understand how to build the, the conversations and how to, how to understand what's going on in psychology so that you don't skip those steps and start to get caught overly commoditized. And we talk about value, even if you are in a very highly commoditized industry where you're just one of a bunch of other options, you still are the value. You and your company are the top pieces of value and you can actually get people to pay on average even more than 15% higher for the same kind of product if they see value in you and your company. Now you guys have probably been asked, what do you do? Go out and network and everybody goes, oh yeah, hi, my name's Joe and I do sales coaching and I go blah, blah, blah and I vomit all of my business crap all over people, right? And then somebody goes, oh, they're waiting for their turn to jump in. They say, oh, my name's Jim and I do marketing, blah, blah, blah. And then we just exchange cards and we go home, we say, hey, look at me, I networked. Right? We're all proud of ourselves because we went out and we talked to people about what we do. But the challenge is, and uh, there's a wonderful TED Talk uh, by Simon Sinek called uh, What Great Leaders Do to Inspire Innovation. And it's all about the why. People don't care what you do. They care why you do it. And so in your business, when you're talking to people and you're, they're asking you about what do you do, it's more important to tell them, here's how I, this is what I help people do. This is the impact I make for my customers. This is what I get excited about. This is what's important to me right? That's way more important than what you do. And I see too many people screwing this up. We're not going to go too much into that. But when we talk about personal branding, this is what we're trying to do because here's what's going on. Selling, everybody kind of messes up this definition because everybody's got a different opinion. But the best definition I've ever heard, it's simply the transfer of emotion. If you think about that for a second, if you've ever had one customer, one customer that's given you $1 or one customer that's been happy you have some belief. Now, if you've done it more than once, wonderful. If you haven't done it, then you have to figure out where, how you're going to get the belief by maybe doing some buy, you know, focus groups and stuff like that. But selling is simply that transfer of emotion. If you feel like what you have is valuable and that's going to help people and you think as a hero, how I'm going to move somebody towards um, taking action and getting them to solve this problem, that's really a transfer of emotion. Your job is just simply to help them see what you see. Not to convince them to buy, not to get show them the ROI, not to just talk about price and product, but to get them to believe that if they take action, this is going to be really cool. Okay. So this is another one I like to talk about is how quickly are we authentic? And when we talk about metrics and numbers, this is a metric that I actually put in front of myself a couple of years back where I said, okay, what, what's something that's going on in my conversation? Well, uh, and it happens to everybody is it takes us a while to kind of ramp up because we're a little bit insecure because we deal with rejection, because we deal with all this internal stuff on our own mind is we get into conversations and we're kind of a little bit hesitant, right? We're a little bit like, mm, you know, I want to see how this goes before I can be my true self. I don't want to, you know, be vulnerable. I don't want to risk anything. And so what I realized is that it takes about a minute to a couple minutes and even longer for us to kind of warm up to people. Right. And I thought, well, wait a minute, but that's where the real connection, that's where the real conversation happens when people sort of let their guard down and they're normal. It's two humans talking. And so I put this as a metric for myself is to say, what if I sped up that authenticity piece? What if I was just absolutely myself right away and put it out there, not worrying about, am I going to be rejected? Am I going to be insecure? And just saying, you know what, I'm just going to be me as fast as possible. And that one thing, that shift I made, especially on my podcast, my videos and my sales calls and my trainings has absolutely transformed everything that I do because people get it right away. Now, by being speed to authenticity, you also are able to control calls because people go, something is up here that we're going to talk about disrupting. Something is up. This is somebody that I should maybe be talking to. And this is really interesting. This is somebody that I should be paying attention to and you get to control that call. So speed to authenticity is absolutely key. Now, let me talk for a second about personal branding. And that personal branding side of it is really important. We talk about you're the product and personal branding is basically your reputation. What do people know about you before they even interact with you? Also, when you're online, are you consistent online as you are face to face? Are you consistent on the phone or in your email, in your digital communication, in your uh, in newsletter, all the stuff? Are you the same person or do you have like Jekyll and Hyde and all these different personalities? So I want you to look at your social media stuff, look at your LinkedIn and what you can do is you can step back and say, and I've done this a number of times, is think about your brand and what you want to say. Write down, you know, a 
you know, a, a 140 word sort of description of you and then write out a, a paragraph and then write out a three paragraph. So have a short, a, a micro one, a short one, a medium and a long version of the same thing and make sure that that's coming across in all of your communication and stick to that brand. So people go, ah, I get it. Right now, if you're not sure, check what others say about you say, you know, this is what I'm trying to be and go and ask people what if you were to describe me, how would you describe me? And this is where you're going to get a big eye opener because there's a difference between that perception and reality. And then when you're out talking to people, here's the easiest thing is be, be really good at testing your language, whether you're face to face or on the phone, here's the test. And you want to write this down. This is the best test you're ever going to do is if you do something, you say it and people smile and nod, it's probably pretty good. Keep saying that. However, if what you say creates blank stares or dead space on the phone, it probably sucks. Stop saying it. I say this to myself all the time. I might think one of the things I say is funny. <laughs> I might I might say something that I think smart or cute or whatever it is, but if they don't respond, it probably sucks, right? And it's not just individuals, but all over the place. When, you, when you're looking and working with people, just get really good at being okay to not be right all the time and say, I'm constantly in this testing mentality to get better and better at my language. Now, if you, uh, I'm going to talk for a second. I hope that you're not here looking for this guy, right? This is joegerard.com. I'm joegerard.ca, so this is not me. But the reason I bring him up is I always get, <laughs> I always get lots of uh, feedback and I get people that for the SEO juice, world's greatest salesman, sold tons of cars, but old school sales guy, right? Back in the 80s, the 70s, 80s, he sold a lot of cars, Guinness Book of World Records. And one of the things, like he was the kind of guy that would be, you know, if you want to connect with your customers, make sure that you have every brand of cigarette in your desk um, because every customer smokes something different. And so that kind of stuff, that's the kind of stuff that he would talk about. But he also did a lot of things with, um, you know, really making sure you remember people and connect with them, ask questions. And the reason I bring him up is because now I want to talk a bit about sales history. And the reason it's important to understand sales history is because some of these things will be an eye opener for you to understand where we are now and where we've come from so that you can understand what you need to do differently moving forward. Because there's a lot of things that we think about when we're selling that are actually really old school mentality type things. So to shift, shift our mindset, let's talk for a second about what's happened. Back in the 20s, there was a guy named E.K. Strong, right? And he was the first sort of uh, person that wrote any professional sales guides. He wrote this theories of selling. And the reason I bring that up is a lot of these things that he taught then are still being used today. So think about this. Back in the 20s, this was the first time we started writing professional sales. Then what they did is salespeople started to realize, ooh, we can use psychology. We can start manipulating. We can start doing things to get people to take action. And we can test these techniques, all these things to get people to do stuff. And so what they did in the 70s, they invented what's called a professional professional buyer. Now, why do they do that? Well, to stop people from selling to them. That's exact. That's why people have the RFP proposal. That that's why they have the buying, the purchasing department, and the dreaded, you know, let you know, send us a quote, send us an offer, that kind of stuff, is because we invented professional buyers, and it was simply to stop people from trying to sell us, right? And that was a big divide. And that was a big rift in the whole buying and selling process. And as we went forward, you know, now we had to get really creative. And in the '80s, a guy named Neil Rackham wrote a book called Spin Selling, which a lot of people read, and um, and actually, I get a lot of people People ask me to do training on spin selling and it's a bit a way to ask questions. And what it was in the 80s was really all about getting back to productivity. Started to study what works, what doesn't, especially in the complex sale where there was multiple stages where we're doing like we talked about earlier in those stages. And it was really a relentless focus on diagnosing. But if we know now that people are so busy, that we have all this stuff to do, the consultative selling process is quite lengthy and it means we're going in, you know, asking people what keeps them up at night. So what we want to do now is the newer versions are things like the challenger sale, the insight sale, that when we come to the party, that we demonstrate value right away right? Not just information. We don't just give them white papers. We don't just give them stuff. And that thing people are buying based on consensus. They're trying to get widespread acceptance in their organizations and across, you know, their buying committees, their family, their friends and saying, Hey, what do you guys think of this? We do it all the time when we go online and we look at reviews. So you need to get really good at bringing value right away. That's why we're doing this webinar. I hope that you find enough value that you say, Hmm, that's interesting. What else is going on in the challenger model? Basically it's all about, you know, that we don't, you know, relationship selling is not dead, but we earn our relationships because of the ways that we help people, the value that we bring. So we can't just go and expect people to spend a bunch of time to us with us and get to know us. That's the old school selling mentality. Now moving forward, where sales is going, this is all the research that we're doing. I think what we're trying to do is, is really bridge this gap. Sellers are starting to be seen as resources 
So if you're good at becoming this ultimate resource, being a strategic partner, engaging in your clients earlier in the process to be somebody where they say, hey, I'm thinking about this. Can you can you tell me about how that works? Because you need to be an expert in your marketplace. We're also seeing a lot more collaborative selling into the marketplace, people working together to solve customer challenges. And so this is where we're gonna go. So in order to do that, you need to get really good at being a resource, at being a partner, at thinking about your customers challenges before they do so that you can share with them things that maybe they're not seeing. And that's what we're going to get into. Okay. Now everybody knows the definition of insanity. I ask this all the time, every workshop I do, and everybody can recite this verbatim, doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. But I think with the pace of change and everything that's going on today, this is my new definition, doing the same thing over and over and expecting the same results. This is why we adopt a testing mentality. If we just keep doing the same thing over and over, our results are actually going to get worse. You know, with the pace of change, with the way things are going, technology, the way customers buy, you need to get good at being adaptable, at, at, at being okay with change and being able to constantly pivot in your own business. And that's why when we build these conversations that we have to make them so they're flexible, okay? Now we get into like the really fun stuff here. Um, and we're probably, I'm gonna look at my time here. We're probably about another 20, 20 minutes or so. And the, the brain is really interesting to me. The brain is made up of three sort of major parts. And what's, um, what's going on with the brain is that the, the first part is our oldest brain is our reptilian brain right? This is all about survival, fight or flight, how we, you know, our breathing, our regulation, and the fact that when we walk into a room, we either trust that person or we don't trust that person. And as we evolve, we develop the limbic system. Limbic system is essentially our emotions. It's where we create our associative memory. And it's the reason that we have social contacts and build tribes. The newest one is our neocortex, and that's basically about logic and thinking, and this is where most people start their conversations from. This is where we start to talk about features and benefits, and this is why when the car salesman comes up to you and says, here, let's talk about you know, what color do you want, what about this, what about that, why it feels weird, because our reptilian brain is structured in such a way to keep us safe. So when we think about the brain in our conversations, the way it works is the reptilian brain acts as a gatekeeper. Its job is to say, hey, if this isn't dangerous, I can ignore it. If it's not new or exciting, I can ignore it. If it is new and exciting, then the limbic system kicks in and says, hey, that's kind of interesting. What is that? And then we say, hey, maybe let's pass. If we like that, it feels good. There's a story to it. Then we pass it on to the neocortex for processing. Hope that makes sense. Right, we pass it to the neocortex. So nothing hits that neocortex until these other pieces have fired in our brain because we are not this one big computer where we're just processing things constantly. We just can't do that. Our brain takes mental shortcuts and it's typically to keep us safe because we are survival creatures. Now, when we're talking to people, when we're doing things, our job is to disrupt patterns. Our job is to create excitement. So when you're interacting with your clients, what are you doing to disrupt those patterns? What are you doing to get them to pay attention to you and cut through that noise? So if you've ever heard of these three things, probing, handling objections, and closing, then you've probably taken some of the old school training methodology. And that was like I talked to you about 1925 EK Strong. This is what we talked about is that these are things that we've talked about for years is probing, right? Really get digging deep and trying to figure out what's going on, handling objections, being, being ready for anything they throw at you. So we know exactly what to say when they said this and closing them, get, you know, using a technique to get them to take action. And the challenge with this is that this works really well in the transactional sale, but not so much in the complex sale because people can feel that this is happening. We know that this is going on. So what we want to do is this, instead of say, for example, handling objections, if you get an objection, you're probably too late. That doesn't mean we're not going to, I'm not going to talk about how to handle objections, but that happens probably later in the process. If you get them too early, you're probably too late. The principle, the psychology principle of, of consistency means that if somebody vocalizes a yes or a no, most likely they're going to comply with that behavior even if they change their mind down the road. So even if you're having a conversation and they say no to something and you convince them otherwise and their brain goes, actually, I can see how it's the other way, they're still likely to stay with that no. So our job is instead of de dealing with objections, our job is to reduce resistance. Our job is to make it so that less resistance happens in our conversation. And there's two kinds of resistance. The first one is the knee-jerk reactions. And, and what this is, it's called reactance. It's where we put up our hand and say, mm, no, I don't like that. It doesn't feel right. I don't want to do that. And you know, I, it's too expensive. I, it's not a good time. And we start to say all the reasons it's, it's not good. The second one is anticipated future regret. And what that means is that we either 
do something that we're, we, and we think we're going to regret it, or we don't do something because we think we're going to regret it. So we, we feel like if we do this, this is a mistake. If we don't do this, this is a mistake. And these are the two things that are playing in our mind, especially when we're trying to make a decision. And your job in your conversation is to reduce that resistance. Your job is to reduce that first one, the knee-jerk reaction, and focus instead on the second one, is to say, how can we better create this change story? How can we make this resistance lower on the, on the end and the result in this change story that we're going to create? And so what we do is often I see these conversations happen where it's just people waiting for their turn to jump in and say the stuff. And as soon as we say the stuff, we typically lose. We start to, we start to run on, we become a pitch. And I hear this thing happen all the time where we take this deep breath and we say all the stuff, right? So it's like this double dutch skipping rope thing where we're just waiting for our turn to jump in just like this, um, this person skipping rope. And I found this wonderful video that sort of illustrates what I hear when I listen to sales calls and watch this. This is what we think we're doing. So we think we're all clever, but instead, what we do is this. We wait for this opening, fall on our face. And this, I remember finding this video a while back, and it's just so perfectly exact. It, it, it illustrates what we do in our sales conversations. We think we're doing something really creative, but we just jump in, we fall on our face because we say all the stuff. And remember, it's not about the product. It's not about the price. It's about you and your ability to help people see th something that maybe they're not seeing. So here's something that I always talk about, rookie magic. This is what I see all the time, especially in organizations, new salespeople, they come out of the gates hot. And typically around 18 months, year and a half, they start to struggle. And why is that? And I have people tell me all the time, well, is it because we lost confidence or we got complacent or we, you know, we started to, you know, get too comfortable or all these things that happen, but it's, it's the same thing that happens to veteran salespeople. The same thing happens to entrepreneurs or the tired rep syndrome. We become experts. We start to know our business so well. We start to know our customer problems so well that we anticipate problems and say things like this. I know exactly what you need or here's what you should do. Right, and we start to pre-diagnose what's going on, and we don't actually listen. We don't use our ears to understand what's really going on and help our customers come to this realization. That's what that sales hero is all about. So, if you're a doctor and you do that, what happens? If you pre-diagnose, if you rush to that diagnosis, you you don't necessarily you, you kill people. But in in sales, if you pre-diagnose, you do this, you're probably not going to kill people. I hope not. Um, but you kill the chance for them to do business with you. So what we do instead is we get really good at asking questions. Now, if you haven't got it so far, if you came uh, to this webinar without getting it, um, you know, send me a message and I'll send you my questions guide on how to ask the best questions in your sales process. But your questions actually has, have to be good to help your customer come to realizations, come to the understanding of what they need to do. Right. You ask them questions like, you know, so tell me about what's going on in your business. What's what type of projects you're working on? They tell you about this. Oh, how's that going? And who's who's working on that? How much time do you guys spend? Oh, cool. Interesting. And you work them through this series of questions. So they start to come to the realization of how much more of an impact this is having. You say, now, who else is affected because of this? And how long does that typically take you guys to do? Oh, okay. Now you mentioned that you were looking at making a change. What kind of change are you looking at making? Those are kinds of questions you're trying to build into your sales process so you really understand what you're trying to do before you rush to solve. The other part is how well do you know their story? How well do you know where, they're, where they are now and where they're trying to go? And more importantly, how well do you tend to that story? How well do you actually listen Ask clarifying questions until you really understand what that change is going to look like because too often we ask questions, we don't acknowledge them, and we just move on to the next step. And then the other part is what kind of ideas and insights do you share with them? When we just design insights, we say, okay, let's really look at your customer, look at what's going on in their world, and take it to a larger place. What's going on in the world as a whole that everybody can agree on? And that's why I talked to you about how many people need more stuff to do. That's a, that's a big idea that everybody says, yeah, that makes sense. And we say, okay, now in your industry, talk to me about what's going on here because what we're seeing is that these are the challenges. This is what's happening. These are the trends. These are the changes we're expecting. We go, yeah, we're seeing that too. And then you go, now in your organization, I'm imagining that this goes on and this happens. And they say, yeah, that's what's going on. And the people that are involved, these are the things that are going on. Yep. And then for you, you're trying to make decisions on this and this and this. And, and that's where the conversation now is, is more of a hypnotic 
hypnotic language because now we've actually helped them see the cause and effect to everything that's happening in their decision. So when we build this in our programs, we try and figure out how can we share insights with our customers that actually get them to think and start to see the bigger picture rather than focusing instead on the pinpoint challenge that we're looking at instead of just solving that with a product or a service. Now, when we talk about scripts, this is what I always mention is we want to ditch the script, kind of. We write lots of different scripts. We write many conversations out, and then we kind of try and get really um, really focused on being authentic in that language. So now we own that language. So we build these micro conversations because when, when I look at it, there's two things that happen. One, if you're too scripted, you become robotic. So if you know all the things you're supposed to say and this happens and this happens and you just say it like that, I see people just going through that list of questions. It's robotic. It doesn't connect. On the flip side, if you don't have a script, if you don't have a process, you end up winging it. And so what we do instead, like I said, we build these conversation roadmaps. And so when we look at the conversation roadmap, I want to jump back on my pen here, is the conversation roadmap goes like this. We look at what do we do to prepare ourselves for our best conversations. And so questions that we ask is, what do we want to know, right? We start to identify what do we want to know about our customers. We go, what do we want them to know, right? And we ask, what do we want them to feel? What do we want them to think? And we ask, what do we want them to do? right? If we know these things and we start to go like this, our conversations becomes more of like a, um, one of those choose your own adventures because we're trying to find all this stuff out and we have ideas that we've prepared and we have questions that we want to know as we go through. And so we start to set that intention. We set that energy. We get ourselves completely ready to go. So we have a game plan going into our calls. And then we get ready, we make our call, and we do the opening. And our opening is we can change this every time, but our opening really needs to connect. And we use things like the you and because, where we say, I'm really interested to talk to you because, and we create something really genuine about why we want to talk to them, what's exciting for them. Here's something we want to share with you. We're going to either educate them, we're going to share some insights, we're going to connect with them on a personal level. And now once we've done our open opening, guess what happens? Well, anything happens right? Our conversations can take on any form that can happen. And so this is why we want to get good at starting to observe our conversations and what does happen so we can better build these conversations. And what we're trying to do is understand in each conversation, what's the change that's creating? What's the thing that they're doing now? And where are they trying to go? And what's the gap that happens? And so we sit on this conversation, we tend to that story, and we get really good at having this conversation by sharing ideas, by asking questions, by understanding what they're saying, by you know sharing stories with them, by being able to have some proof, by being able to be somebody that we need to be for them so that we can say, oh, that makes a lot of sense. And maybe we add another piece here. But what we're trying to do is, uh, ultimately is to be able to say, ah, I get it. I get what's going on. All right. So then we say, okay, let me just make sure I've got it clear. And we just clarify, right? We do a bit of a, we do a bit of a reframe. I call that a reframe. And so what we do this part of the paraphrasing, we make sure that we understand what's going on. So it sounds like this. It goes like, ah, oh, that makes sense. And you get excited and you make a couple other things to make sure that we're clear. You get excited to then ask them to commit, right? And there's a big difference when we're asking for commitment between asking with a question mark and asking with an exclamation mark. If you get to this point where you say, ah, I get what's going on. You know what? I think here's what we need to do. Our next step is going to be like this instead of, well, would you be open to having another conversation about that? Those are two different kinds of ways to ask for commitment. One of them is weak, one of them is strong, and you have to come from that place of authenticity. Now, when they, we ask for commitment, this is all just a mess and you can keep up here, but basically these are the three things that can happen. They say yes, no, or I'm not sure right? And if they say yes, great, let's move them to become a customer. If they say no, then we typically want to have a couple different commitment objectives. That's what we've prepared for here is what are the things we want them to do? If they say no to our primary request, what's the secondary thing we can have them do? Is it read some information, check out a video, talk to a testimonial, do a demo, whatever it is, we have them do something. And, when, and there's a whole bunch of stuff we do in our training about why that makes sense. And then we have a third level um, objective here as well. And most people don't even ask for commitment, let alone asking a second time or a third time. So this right here will drastically drive your conversations. So we map those out and your conversions, we map those out so you have the highest conversion chances possible. If they say, I'm not sure, this is where we can talk about objections and stalls. 
Now we know, okay, I'm not sure what is it that you're not sure about. And there's only a handful of objections and we actually map out how to structure those objections. So you're prepared for those as well. If they're stalling, we talk about how to deal with stalls as well. So this conversation plan is going to give you the highest likelihood of moving somebody towards a decision. Hope that makes sense for you. Now I'm going to take off my, there we go, take off the pen and we're going to go next slide here. So here are the six things that I was talking about. The first thing we look at is when we build our plan is empathy. What do we know? We, bat, we map out our segments. We map out what's going on. What does keep them up at night? Imagine their world and try and see through their eyes before we talk to them. We don't ask them what keeps you up at night. We should know right? What are the questions we're going to ask? We do our pre-call plan. What do we want to know? What do we want them to know? What are the things that we want to get out of them? How do we figure out if they're the right decision maker? How do we know their decision making process? All these kinds of things. How can we ask them questions that actually get them to think deeper about their problems? We build all that out. Then we say, okay, how well do we understand what's going on? Before we start to rush in and say what we know, do we know that whole change story? Have we got enough out of that. And then we say, okay, what insights do we want to share? What do we want them to know? What do we want them to feel? And we have these big ideas and we'd be able to make sure that we quantify the things that we're saying throughout and demonstrate your ability to solve their problem. The next one, and I'm going to sneeze in one second here. Uh, false alarm. Oh, wait. There it is. All right. So the next one is that we have to play a role is our job is to look at in our relationship with the customer, especially when we first start is how well are we connecting with them? How well are we moving along the lines of being just somebody who's answering questions to becoming a strategic partner and a trusted resource. And that changes and that can adjust. And your job is to figure out that role you need to play. And sometimes it's different for different customers. And then the last one, what are the stories? What are the proof? What are the things you do to support what's going on and how can you connect these ideas? to the emotions. How can you use examples of other people that have gone before to actually connect this stuff? And so when we look at this, like I say, it spells equips. When we look at this, we map this out in your sales process so that you know, okay, these are all the things I need to do in my conversation. If you do this, you have the highest likelihood of connecting to the result. So when to, to wrap up here, the three C's of the conversation are these things is one, get real clear on who your customer is, what their problem is, and what you want to be saying to them. Keep it super, super simple, right? Don't say all sorts of stuff you don't need to say. And in order to do that, we want to make sure you're consistent, is that you're building those repeatable best practices in your conversation, in your customer stages, so you have the most, the highest likelihood of moving people forward the right way. And you're testing that, you're tracking that. Then the last one is your confidence. By building all of these systems and testing them, you start to know what works instead of being overwhelmed that how am I going to get more customers? We focus on the activity instead of the result, okay? And then we say, let's go have some fun. Let's go test it. Let's go try some new things. Let's get rid of any of the challenges we have in our head about what it is and what it's not and just go have some fun and talk to new people. Now, I'm going to do this for a second here. Give me one second. We've got, I've got an offer for you here is you can book an insight session with me to talk about this program. Now, again, in, uh, in the way we do this is the first step is book an appointment with me and we're going to talk about this. Maybe this program's for you. Maybe it's not. This is my consulting program that I do, whether you're a startup, whether you're a coach, um, whether you have an organization and a small team, um, I can help you move your team through this where we actually go through and do these things. We build out this conversation roadmap that I was just saying. We look at those customer stages. We figure out those repeatable best practices. We create accountability in the process. I've got a bunch of templates, tools, resources, done for you type of uh, tools that you can access. Um, our goal is to get results. Our goal is to help you get sales. I don't get paid unless you get paid. So we have a break even guarantee that if you don't make the money for the program, uh, whatever whatever deal we get into, um, if you don't get your money back um, from that, then we then we do a break even guarantee. You get you pay only what you ended up earning. So then we have fun. Okay. This is what our program looks like. Selling with focus program. I've taken a ton of clients through this and this is really the first step in designing your best practice and mastering that sales conversation. So make sure you click on the link and you book a time to chat with me. Um, and that's what we're going to go through. And I'll sort of walk you through what we look through. There's 10 modules that I take you through and we structure this in a way to help you get results. So the first one is we define that perfect customer profile. Look at that avatar, look at the segmenting for what you're doing. Then we figure out your offer that you're doing, why people want to buy, and your personal why on how you're going to connect with people right away. Then we make sure that we talk about the preparation of your sales conversation so that before people come in, you know exactly how you want to take that so you're prepared every single time. 
Then we look at how well do we open our conversations and set the tone and be able to, you know, come at it from this place of, you know, how do we educate? How do we make sure that we catch their attention right away? And we really nail that first opening authenticity, the energy, all that type of stuff, the mindset. Then we get into the common conversation threads. We look at those change stories. How do those things actually happen? How do we map those out? What are the tools we need to build in there? Then we look at asking the best questions, using insights and stories so that we prepare those ahead of time, being able to gain commitment and selling in stages, mapping all that out, putting that into your CRM so you have predictability, dealing with those objections and stalls, but doing it the right way so that you don't deal with them too early. And then we build that mindset for long-term success. We think about how we're going to structure you know, our partnership mentality with our teams. And that's essentially what our program goes through. And uh, yeah, this is, this is what works really, really well for our clients. This is the same process I use for my sales process. This is how I have high ticket sales all the time with what I do and also for my clients. And we get crazy results. So I'm going to leave that up for a couple minutes there and definitely, you know, connect with me. The first step, again, if we look at the stages, you don't have to spend any money. You come and talk to me. I just want a bit of your time to see if you might be a good fit and if I would consider bringing you on as a client for this program. So fill out the, um, the book and appointment one. There's an application that we go through from there. So I hope that helps you out today. You know, if there's any questions, throw them in the chat here. It was good hanging out with you guys. Um, and uh, anything that you need, you know, I have to jump on a sales call in a few minutes here. Um, but yeah, this is what, uh, what we're trying to do is just help you keep this simple, have some fun and get you more customers and make your lives a lot easier. So I hope you enjoyed our time today. Um, like I said, it's just really look at this stuff, take a look and anything that, um, that you're not doing, write it down. Say, how can I get better at each one of these stages? So thank you for joining me today. Um, I've got a couple, a couple of people clicking on it so far. So that's cool. And I look forward to connecting with you guys. Looks like Jim. Yeah. Okay, cool. And I will talk to you guys soon. So thank you for joining me today. That's it for mastering the sales conversation.